Good morning and uh, thank you for the invitation to bring God's word to you at the beginning of this day at the School of Theology. All Christians are theologians, some good, some bad, some off the rail, some eccentric. But sadly, not all theologians are Christians. As theologians, we must understand the gospel of Jesus Christ at depth. For in meeting Jesus, we're meeting God. But more importantly than understanding the gospel of Jesus at depth, we must respond to it in repentance and faith. And we must proclaim it to others for their salvation. What do you imagine meeting God will be like? What will it be like when you meet God? When you finally come face to face with the Almighty? How do you think you will feel? What, what do you think will happen? What do you think you'll do? What, what do you think you'll say in that moment? Love him or hate him, Gough Whitlam was a larger-than-life politician. We've had lots of prime ministers. It's a kind of open season to change prime ministers. We're a kind of equal opportunity nation where everybody has an opportunity to be prime minister, really. We change them that frequently. But few have had such an impact upon our society, for good or for ill, as Gough Whitlam did in the few years he was Prime Minister in the early 1970s. One biography of him was entitled A Certain Grandeur. When asked how he would meet his maker, Gough Whitlam replied, you can be sure of one thing, I shall treat him as an equal. Even as a joke, you rarely hear such unmitigated arrogance of equality as came from the lips of Edward Gough Whitlam, ACQC. Most people understand, have an inkling, that when we meet the Almighty, we won't treat him as an equal, but fall down in wonder and amazement and worship overwhelmed by his presence. But yet in the Bible, there is another thing that happens when people come to meet God. It's not simply an awareness of God's almighty power, but suddenly an awareness of our own sinfulness. For 250 years, Western civilization has struggled to come to terms with two competing views of humanity's sinfulness. On the one hand, we have the knowledge that nobody's perfect, that all of us are marred by our immorality, failing to live up to our own standards, let alone God's standards. On the other hand, we have the Enlightenment view, which sees all people as good, held back just by the tyranny of institutions, traditions, society or religion. And so Rousseau said, man is naturally good and it is by our institutions alone that men become wicked. I was in a taxi driver the other day trying to share the gospel of Jesus with him, but he assured me he had no need because he was good and that's all that mattered in religion. We may not like to meet, sorry, we may like to meet God at a kind of more equal form, not even as much as, as Gough Whitlam, but walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. But that fellowship with God was only in the time of man's innocence. It ceased when we rebelled against God and were cast out of the garden. To be replaced by a great gulf between God and humanity. For God doesn't delight in wickedness, and evil may not dwell with him, the psalmist says. His eyes are too pure to look upon sin, the prophet says. Just as our eyes can't tolerate as much as a small speck of dust, but it requires us to remove it as quickly as possible, so God in purity cannot tolerate human sinfulness. 
But rather than removing it immediately, God has chosen to patiently endure humanity's willful ignoring of him by giving us up to our own folly. For the atheist and the agnostic, religion is an intellectual puzzle with God not proving enough information to persuade them of his existence as if the arrogance of, of, of humanity that God should be answerable to us. They don't understand that God has chosen not to be known by sight or by human wisdom, not to the wise nor to the rulers of this age, not to the magicians nor to the debaters. Rather, he chose to reveal himself by his words that the prophets spoke to his people. And the greatest of the prophets of the Old Testament was Moses. He was the prophet upon whom all prophecy is modelled. Unlike Gough Whitlam, Moses was a very meek man. It was part of his greatness that he was meek. He is described as the meekest man of all the world. For Moses knew the Lord face to face like none other. The Lord spoke to him face to face like a friend. But when Moses asked to see God's glory, he was told, you shall not see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Israel was aware of the edict, that edict throughout its centuries, aware of the unworthiness of anybody to see God, aware of the danger to life of ever seeing God, awareness that our sin brings death and condemnation to any who come too close to God dominated the few times when people actually did meet God. So we read of Gideon's fear in Judges 6 when he was visited by the angel of the Lord and God reassuring him, peace be to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Or similarly, Samson's father, Manoah, speaking to his wife when the, meeting the angel of the Lord in Judges 13. We shall die. We shall surely die, for we have seen God. Or think again of Job, how after the chapters of wrestling with his so-called friends and struggling to understand God's will, he finally has God speak to him out of the whirlwind, challenging Job's questionings, asking Job to answer God's questions, to which Job responds, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. But nowhere is this more clearly brought out for us than Isaiah when he met God in the temple. Uzziah, the king, had been on the throne for over 50 years, a little bit like Queen Elizabeth II, a whole people had grown up knowing only this king. It was a time of national wealth and of, of peace and security. But the storm clouds of the mighty Assyrian Empire were gathering apace. Now the king was dead. Insecurity would be any, everywhere. And Isaiah the prophet was in the temple. Then he saw the Lord saw him in his sovereign majesty, high and lifted up with his train of his robe filling the temple, saw him in his holiness as the cherubs sang their song, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Here, face to face with the almighty God, the true king, Yahweh, in all his holiness, remember how Isaiah responded to that sight. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. There's that overwhelming awareness of the unworthiness of a sinful man to come into the presence of the Almighty holy God. 
And the edict to Moses still holds, you shall not see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Isaiah knows he's lost. He's unclean. Isaiah knows he's sinful and deserving of death. But this time, there's the wonderful news of forgiveness that comes from the sacrifice on the altar as the burning coal is taken to him and the words are spoken, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. For God has a job for Isaiah, the job of being the prophet of doom, the job of declaring the coming judgment of God, the job of so declaring the word of God as to bind people into their sinful rebellion and rejection of God and their inevitable destruction. For Isaiah is not only a man of unclean lips, but also a man who dwells in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And it was this, these people who centuries later, the Lord Jesus Christ came to declare the kingdom of God. He was God become man, but the people didn't know it. And they were looking upon God and all they saw was a man. Not till later did they realise that they had seen the glory of the word become flesh that they had seen the glory of the one and only Son of the Father, that they had seen the glory of God, full of grace and truth in that man. Yet, slowly, they became aware of something special about this man. He prophesied in his hometown of Nazareth in such a way as to get him kicked out of town. He preached with such astonishing authority as he, to cast out demons, making everybody wonder at his authority and power. He healed people, exorcised demons in such numbers that his fame spread everywhere as he went preaching in the synagogues of Galilee and Judea. It was during this time of amazing prophetic ministry that we come to the passage that was written, read for us from Luke chapter 5 about the miraculous catch of fish where Simon Peter meets the Lord. Simon Peter was amongst the disciples of John the Baptist but John had been locked up in prison by the immoral King Herod for, one, for warning people about going to hell. There's nothing new under the sun about being punished for warning people about going to hell. After John was arrested, Jesus started preaching in Galilee. Peter heard Jesus in his hometown at Capernaum. Indeed, Jesus stayed with Peter and even healed Peter's mother-in-law. So Peter had already met Jesus when on the occasion of the miraculous catch of fish, he came to really meet Jesus. Peter was already well acquainted with the, and positively disposed towards Jesus and his preaching. He even let him use his boat as the pulpit and called him in verse 5, Master. But it was when Jesus told him to go into the deep and fish that we see Peter's hesitancy about Jesus. I mean, he'd been out all night. He'd caught nothing and he'd mended his nets and put them away. Now this country carpenter-come-preacher was telling the seagoing fishermen how and when and where to catch fish. Now, Peter may have had a bad night with no fish, but he knew daytime was no time to go fishing. Master, he protests, we toiled all night and took nothing. Oh, and then he concedes, but at your word, I'll let down the nets. After all, Jesus had shown extraordinary power over demons and over all manner of sickness, as well as teaching with extraordinary authority, proclaiming the new day of the kingdom of God. He wants to go fishing. I'll humour him. But it was when the catch of fish was too big to handle, when he called over to his partners and the nets were breaking and both ships were sinking under the weight of the catch, it was then that Peter finally met Jesus. It was then that he, Peter saw that this was no ordinary man. 
It was then that Peter understood he was in the presence of some extraordinary messenger from God. And Peter responded in the only way appropriate for a man to respond. In the only way godly Old Testament people responded. In the only way a man would or could respond. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Here was Gideon. He was Manoah. He was Job in the whirlwind. He was Isaiah in the temple. He was Peter amongst the smelly dying fish in the boat, no doubt flapping about to gain their last breath of life, painfully aware of his own sinfulness, of his own lostness in the presence of the God's holy servant in his mortality and death, painfully aware of his lostness as a sinner, before the hands of the holy God. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Uh, we're not sure what Peter understood about Jesus at that moment. I doubt that he knew that Jesus was God, but he was moved from the secular term master to the religiously loaded word Lord. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord, not all uses of the word Lord, of course, meant God, but the emphatic position of the word at the end of this statement and the contrast with sinful and the contrast with the emphatic word man all point to Peter speaking more truth than he knows and pushes the reader of Luke's gospel to think of God. More importantly, than Peter's uncertain understanding of Jesus is his all too clear understanding of himself. Peter now knew. He now confessed that he was a sinful man. The impact that Jesus had upon him was the impact that any touch with God will have upon us. The overwhelming sense of our sinfulness Woe to me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Living amongst the sinful peoples of this world, I'm unaware of my own sinfulness. We mark on the curve, and we Australians like to be in the middle. When everybody else is unclean, my uncleanness is not, uh, not noticeable. When I judge myself by my company that I keep, I can claim to be not too bad, average, all right. But when the bright light of God's holiness appears, I am overwhelmed by my sense of my sinfulness. When God's absolute power and purity appears before me, I am overwhelmed by the sense of my own sinfulness. And all I can do is beg to be spared the death I deserve. Depart from me. Leave me. Go away. For I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. Peter wasn't specifying any particular certain specific sins that he had committed. Face to face with God, we don't need to rehearse all the particular failings that we have had. We'll be just overwhelmed by the totality of our sinfulness. It's not simply, I have sinned, but in fact, I am sinful. I am a sinful man. And all we can hope for is that I'll be left alone. I, I may smile a little before I die, as the psalmist puts it. Leave me alone. Please don't treat me as I deserve, but depart from me that I may return to the cave in the darkness and hide. But mercifully, Jesus didn't depart from him. Jesus didn't leave him alone. 
For Jesus had come to bring forgiveness. Like the burning coal from the altar in Isaiah's time, Jesus had come to be the altar of sacrifice. Jesus had come to die for the sins, for Peter's sins, and not only for Peter's, but also for the sins of the whole world. For Jesus had come to rise from the dead and bring a new kingdom of forgiveness and mercy. And what a difference mercy and forgiveness make. And you can see it in John 21 where Simon Peter meets his saviour. The disciples have gone back fishing after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Peter was there taking the lead again, spending all night without catching anything. When at daybreak a man called to them, telling them to let down their nets on the right side of the boat, suddenly a whole shoal of fish, more than they could pull in, filled the nets, and they recognised it was the risen Lord Jesus. And when Peter heard that, he didn't fall on his knees and declare, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, Lord. No, no, not this time. Not after the death, not after the resurrection. No, this time, Simon Peter threw himself into the sea and swam for all he was worth, the hundred metres to the shore, to meet his Saviour and the Lord. We love Simon Peter. He's the most popular of the apostles because I think he wears his heart on his sleeve more than anyone. He makes mistakes aplenty, just like us. But when he gets it right, he also gets it right with a passion. When I'm in my sin, I sit in darkness, hiding from others and hiding from myself hiding my immorality and pretending to be all right. When I'm confronted by God, I am overwhelmingly aware of my sinfulness and terrified of the judgment that I deserve, wishing to be left alone, to live and die in peace. When I meet the Saviour, I'm humbled to see my forgiveness has been won and my sin has been paid for and long to come into the presence to enjoy being part of the family of love. When I meet my Saviour, I also meet my Lord and find he has a job for me to proclaim to others the condemnation of sin and God's gracious mercy to sinners in the death and resurrection of Jesus. What of you? Have you met with Jesus yet? Have you met God in Jesus? If so, you will be aware of your sin, overwhelmingly aware of your sin. And aware and afraid of the condemnation of God. Have you met your Saviour? If so, you'll be aware of the forgiveness of sins that He won by His sacrificial death on your behalf. And you'll be aware that He is your Lord who has a task for you to fulfill, declaring to others that wonderful mercy that you do not deserve, that mercy can never be deserved, but that can be for them, that they may know Jesus as their Saviour and Lord. But what would it be like to meet him on the last day with all our ministries before him, calling him Lord and speaking of what we have done for him our lectures that we've delivered, our awards and our degrees we have received, our weighty tomes that we have published and our untarnished reputation and tenured appointments that we have and our titles and and have him declare to us, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Depart from me. 
As Paul reminded Titus, he saved us not because of our works done in, by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. All Christians are theologians, but sadly, not all theologians are Christians. Let us turn back, like Peter, recognising that we rightly deserve Jesus to depart from us because we are sinful. And recognising that we want to embrace Jesus as our Saviour, cleansing us and forgiving us of all our sin, for he paid that price for us. Let's pray. A prayer that is the prayer of forgiveness, the prayer that really acknowledges our sinfulness, acknowledges Jesus as Saviour and Lord, and ask him to be our Saviour and our Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, I know that I'm not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life, I'm guilty of rebelling against you and ignoring you. And I need forgiveness. Thank you for sending your son to die for me that I may be forgiven. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give me new life. Please Forgive me and change me that I may live with Jesus as my Lord. Amen. Now we have a slight change in gear. As I mentioned a couple of things about that sermon and... Uh, turn over you to ask questions as you would like to or make comments as you will. Gear changing is hard. <clears throat> and I think that's what I was asked to do, so we will do it. I've got four observations to make um, about this, the uh, sermon. Uh, it'll take a few moments, then. Observation one is just to tell you about its background. The sermon was first preached in May, uh, May this year at St Andrew's Cathedral as part of a celebratory series of visiting preachers, uh, all speaking from Luke's Gospel on the topic of meeting Jesus. That's what I was required to do. And so that's why I invented this sermon. Uh, uh, as with today's congregation, uh, there's a greater degree of biblical knowledge and education and sophistication than was assumed in the normality of a suburban church. So there's a lot of Bible references, allusions peppered through that I may have actually had to use differently in a different context. Second observation. Today's exercise is a difficult one for three reasons for me. Uh, I suspect it was for Simon as well yesterday, but I was off somewhere else, so I didn't catch up with what Simon was doing. Here are my three reasons for being difficult. <clears throat> Firstly, preaching God's word is not a plaything for me, or anybody I hope, uh, to put on a show, and it's a, it's a deadly serious business as far as I'm concerned, preaching God's word. So secondly, uh, the second reason, I don't preach the Bible, uh, but I preach the Bible to people. 
So I can't simply repeat the cathedral sermon to show you what it was like. If you want to do that, download it. Um, and, but I need to re reconfigure it for the people I'm speaking to here. And so I changed the introduction to talk to you, to talk about theologians, and the beginning and the ending uh, was connected to sp address you. And I meant it. You can come to the School of Theology and not be a Christian, and I don't want you to leave not a Christian. I want you to come to Christ. I'm actually preaching to you. I can't just preach sermons for show. It doesn't work. Thirdly, while it's quite appropriate at the same time to professionally analyse sermons, I do it every sermon I hear. We always go home and discuss the sermon as well as try and listen to the sermon as we work out how to preach better. Uh, they're not, but if that's going to be the case, if you're going to professionally kind of analyse and work out, then it's got to be a genuine sermon. There's no point trying to analyse a, a phony sermon. It's a genuine sermon calling upon people to respond appropriately to the word of God. So I readdress this sermon to this gathering to confront you once more with the claims of Christ, provide for you a genuine occasion in which you are being called upon to become Christians, which I have just done and I meant, and I still do. Because that's the only kind of sermon you can really discuss. Any other one's phony, for in the end, all sermons are evangelistic. Observation three. This is a sermon on a narrative passage which creates its own homiletic problems. But it highlights in particular the importance of systematic theology in expositional preaching. In an essay on mythology, C.S. Lewis wrote in a somewhat platonic fashion, as he does, on the problems of universals and particularities. He noted the problem of either taking abstract generalities or concrete particularities and the impossibility of doing the, the two at the same time. The problems, of course, of the generalities is it doesn't touch life. The problem of the particularities is it only touches the life it's talking about. Thus, he commended myth. Uh, he was a great mythologist himself. He commended myth as a means of engaging with abstract supernatural generality in the narratives of a particularity. The difference between myth and Christianity, he pointed out with great vigour, is that God entered historically, factually into the world. Our myths are true. Well, he would say the other myths are true too. They're just not historically true. They're not true in that sense. So in preaching the narratives of the New Testament, and in this case, the narrative of the gospel, I'm expounding and explicating the doctrinal generalities experienced in hearing the particular historical event. It's not to retell the account of the gospel uh, as if that can be improved upon or as if the congregation's too thick to follow a story. One thing a good story does is it doesn't need retelling. One of the problems we have in teaching Sunday school is once they've heard the parable of prodigal son, next year when you try and teach it again, they will say, well, we know that one. It's, that's the nature of the particularities of the stories. Rather, what I'm seeking to do is place the experience of hearing and the experiencing the event into the context of the eternal verities that it is both revealing and particularising so that you get the impact of the event in the framework of thought, of the truths that... Observation four. The critical point of the passage is that Peter's growing awareness of who Jesus is plunges him into the awareness of his own sinfulness. This confronts us with our awareness of who Jesus is and our sinfulness. That is something of a googly for the non-Christian world, who at best think meeting God would lead you to humility. 
but rarely think meeting God would lead you to sinfulness and the need for salvation. So understand this then. We need to explain and illustrate the doctrines of sin, especially in relation to the holy God and his rejection of sinful humanity. With the hope that so confronted by sin, they may accept God's offer of forgiveness in the person and work of Jesus. The process and structure of the sermon was therefore to set the confrontation in theological, biblical and Lucan context in order to challenge the congregation and their thinking about their own sinfulness in God's sight and their need to accept God's offer of forgiveness in the person and work of Jesus. There we go. There's a few observations uh, uh, about preaching. I've this passage. Uh, I am in uh, a, a um, what's the word? Someone who uh, is not conscious of my competence. I'm unconscious of my competence in preaching. And so to explain what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, I now find quite difficult. I wrote notes next to the sermon uh, two days ago when I was at a conference somewhere else speaking, um, and I filled about three pages of notes of what the steps were I was taking and the impact and intention of doing it. I had no idea that I had worked so many things into one sermon. This is not a, an abnormal sermon. This is just a standard sermon, except I did it. I did it about the time the invitation came, so I said, well, let's I use that one. And Mark has endured it twice, because he was in the congregation. <laughs> Do you want to ask questions, make comments? The first question was, uh, uh, the Old Testament, I had a whole series of Old Testament allusions, references, etc. Um, uh, what would happen if they were left out? Why were they put in? What was, what was their significance? Yes, some parts of the New Testament are clearly written as fulfilments of the Old Testament. And so um, Mark chapter 6, he, he um, uh, feeds the 5,000 and then he walks on the water, and the reason they are afraid is because they didn't understand the loaves in Mark 6. Because if you'd understood the fulfilment of Moses and the feeding of the multitude, you would have understood the walking on the water kind of thing. So they're fulfilment. But this one's not particularly a fulfilment of Old Testament that you could, it's not a fulfilment of the storyline particularly. But in order to understand this one, you have to understand the concept of sin. And you have to understand the concept of why you wouldn't want to embrace the God who has just revealed himself to you. And so how do I do that? Well, I can talk in a systematic theology fashion. I can quickly whip out two ways to live and say God has created the world and man has rebelled against, right? But the easier, quicker way of demonstrating the concepts of the holiness of God the sinfulness of man and the great gulf between the two is to pick up the, the two or three references in the Old Testament where the same thing Peter did happened to there. So it is helping the hearers change their mindset to understand what is taking place in the mark of it. Now, do you need to do that? No, my guess is with this crowd, I most likely didn't. But in general, if you haven't accepted... God's holiness and human sinfulness and God's judgment on human sinfulness, Peter's response really doesn't make sense or the sense you'll make of it is wrong. So that's why I was putting that in. Then you pointed out that I had several introductions. Um, yes, I, I sat once in a room uh, with John Chapman and Dick Lucas and they had a fight, uh, a verbal fight, uh, uh, a vigorous D debate um, over me as the third person as if I wasn't there in the room 
It went on for half an hour of embarrassment as to what's wrong with Philip and what's not wrong with Philip. And Philip was there. It was, <laughs> it was a very weird conversation that I had. And it was about introductions. Uh, and for Chapo, you want to get going as quickly as you can. For Dick Lucas, you don't want the train to leave the station until everybody's on board. I'm on the Dick Lucas end of the spectrum on this sermon in particular. In fact, I don't hit the text, I don't know, I, can't, I can find out, till about 50% of the way through the sermon. You wouldn't know which passage I'm preaching on. That's because in this understanding of this particularity, I've got to lay out all the generalities so that they will pick up what the particularity is about. So most of the sermon is not retelling the narrative, because I find retelling the narrative is dead boring. I give a little bit of the Lucan t story, I give the background, John the Baptist, Capernaum, that kind of thing, but there's not much retelling of what happened, because you've just read it, you heard it, it's a simple narrative. But I need to set that, I need to set your minds into the framework of thinking in order to understand the narrative. So, but I also need to help you face the googlies. There's about two or three googlies in this over that is being bold, right? One is that it's not humility, it's sin. Another is that he wants him to go away rather than have forgiveness. Another is that actually Jesus comes to bring forgiveness and to send him out on a job. So I'm trying to set in sin, judgment, forget all those kinds of concepts of biblical, uh, of biblical theology, uh, of the systematic theology, into people's minds and to get them thinking differently. I'm also trying to challenge the atheists uh, and agnostics because uh, yeah, their attitude is that God should give me enough information for me to be able to assess him. And so I'm trying to unravel that as well. All in a few minutes. There's a long introduction, yes. And Chapo would be really cranky with me. <laughs> but Dick Lucas is still alive. <laughs> Up the back. What is, uh, for the sake of the recording, what is the uh, uh, effect of other people in their, in their effect upon me in thinking through this and then what is the part of my devotional life in thinking through and working out this? Is that right? None and none. <laughs> uh, uh, I try and work on the text. I get the idea of the text. I translate it. I think through it. I then check other translations and get cranky. I then read every commentary that I've got on the passage um, uh, that they can and you know there's all kinds of I, I prefer commentaries I disagree with uh, because they force me to think more uh, in Luke somebody like Godet I find really interesting because he was a Bible believing Christian of a different theological century way of thinking etc he, he poses questions that I you know, they're not my questions, but that gets me thinking. So it's that kind of, you know, the out and out extreme unbelieving commentary I find relatively unhelpful because the assumption base is just so wrong. But the really, you know, my brother's commentary, I read it, but not my brother Peter, but my Christian brother's uh, commentary, uh, I read it, but generally I'm sitting there saying, yes, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm off to sleep. It, it doesn't force me to think. Um, and so, as a personality, I was the third speaker in a debating team. I, I, I learned by disagreement. Uh, the effect of, now, my Bible preparation is my devotional life. So it's not my devotional life feeds into my Bible sermon preparation, my sermon preparation feeds into my personal life, it goes the other way. It seems to me that we ought to take the opportunity, while we've got you here, to ask, over that period of time, what have you seen happening to preaching? And is there anything over that period of time that you would actually draw to our attention 
as we consider uh, the task of preaching for the next 50 years. Yeah. Um, in the Sydney scene in which I've lived, um, uh, I accept the, uh, the common tradition that uh, Broughton, Knox and Donald Robinson and others were teaching people to expound the scriptures but that when John Stott came into the land, people saw what it meant to expound scriptures. And Dudley Ford and John Chapman, then working through the school of preachers, these are very Anglican, sorry for those not Anglicans, but working through the school of preachers, then readjusted the preaching of clergy across, across Sydney and beyond, well beyond Sydney. And in fact, there's, there are, there's an organization in the, the States um, I can't think of the name of it now, uh, that is teaching people to preach. It's really based on Chapo's teaching of, John, of Dick Lucas to, to how to do the John Stott kind of preaching. It's gone worldwide um, because John was uh, a great man and a great preacher um, who showed you how to... Uh, showed you the orthodox strokes of how to stand in a pulpit and preach. Uh, I found him dead boring. Uh, but that's a sign of me, you see. It's the kind of person I agreed with all the time, therefore I couldn't keep listening. But he showed you how to do it. Um, and uh, it was the combination of those things. However, over time, uh, I think our preaching has lost the other side. That is... We think, we, can, we think we're preaching when we teach the Bible and we forget that we're teaching the Bible to people. And so our sermons are turning into oral commentaries where we're just setting out everything that is there that we can fit into 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And we're not actually challenging people to uh, repentance and forgiveness. And so the other influence of the preaching in Sydney, which was profound, was Billy Graham. And Billy Graham, you knew you were in, it was, the game was live. This was not a replay. This was live ammunition. You know, they weren't using duds, they were using real bullets. And people were coming to God right here, right now. <laughs> and that sense of evangelism that lay in the preachers before the John Stott transformation, uh, that sense of, of, of wanting to see people converted tonight in church, I think uh, has disappeared greatly from us. And the kind of old-fashioned evangelical preachers who would just take a verse out of context with a different meaning, etc., but they were preaching for people's salvation. They, they were playing for keeps. And that side of it, I think, has, has disappeared uh, under the weight of oral commentaries. And I think at that point, we're seriously in trouble. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, will you join me in thanking Philip? Thank you.